that we collect the deacons offering. Um, our deacons do wonderful work of taking the offerings that you give and distributing those offerings to or great organizations in the community who are doing amazing work helping people in need. And so that's offering is today. And we have a new organization that we've support, we're supporting now called Housing Hope. And we have the joy today of having Joan Penny here from Housing Hope, and she'll be speaking to us a little bit later in the service. Um, Joan is the Senior Director of Resource Development, Marketing, and Communications at Housing Hope, um, and they do amazing work, and we look forward to hearing more about that. And in the coming weeks and months, we're going to hear from a couple more of our um, mission partners, we may as well call them in the community, that we're supporting doing um, wonderful, wonderful work. So as we enter into worship today, we do so being reminded that uh, we are loved uh, by God unconditionally and that we can trust in God. And with that in mind, let's join in our call to worship. The Lord is our light and our salvation. Why should we be afraid? The Lord is the strength of our lives. Why should we worry? For God is our shelter and retreat. It is in God's presence that we find peace in the midst of the storm and turmoil of our lives. For God lifts us above the fray and sets us high on a rock, safely out of reach of those things that threaten to devour us. So come, let us enter God's presence with thanksgiving and praise, offering our worship with joy. Let's stand and sing, Christ be our light.
Good morning. Please join me in the prayer of praise, which is printed, of course, or up there. O living God of past and future, we praise you for this present moment. Help us to enter into it fully. Fill us with your joy and empower us with your spirit, that our strength may be renewed to trust you in fresh ways and to sing a new song of your goodness in a world which longs for your justice and peace. And please remain seated for the response. Please join me in the prayer of confession and reflection, which will be followed by a period of silent prayer and reflection. As the stories of our lives continue to unfold, we thank you for your faithfulness and your hand of providence which guides us. At the same time, we confess that we often take lives into our own hands, creating storylines that are not true to who we are, out of fear or distrust of your goodness. Help us to relinquish fear and false narratives and listen to your voice of truth and goodness. Hear these words of assurance based on Psalm 27. 
Beloved, we can be confident of this. We will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. For God showers his people with mercy and grace. Know the forgiving love of God. Be at peace and love your neighbor as yourself. Thanks be to God. And now, if you will join me in passing the peace to those around you, in whatever manner both of you are comfortable. This morning's scripture reading, the first one anyway, comes from Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 17 to 22. 
You shall not deprive a resident alien or an orphan of justice. You shall not take a widow's garment in pledge. Remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be left for the alien, the orphan, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all your undertakings. When you beat your olive trees, do not strip what is left. It shall be for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, do not glean what is left. It shall be for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I am commanding you to do this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Sherry. That might seem like an odd reading, <laughs> but uh, it'll make sense um, as we get into our story this morning. And our series this uh, summer for the few weeks is um, looking at some of the stories of maybe the lesser known characters of the Bible and how their story and our story might intersect in some ways and we can learn some things from their story. And today we're looking at Ruth. This is a delightful short story nestled in, in between the book of Judges and 1 Samuel in the Old Testament. And it's a bit of a challenge to cover the entire story in one sermon, so I'm going to take one particular angle on it and invite you to read the entire story sometime this week. It's only four chapters long and takes about 20 minutes to read at a leisurely pace. So see what God brings to your attention as you read it. But the setting here is the time of the Judges. So this is about 1500 B.C., uh, this was a turbulent and somewhat lawless time in the history of Israel with some really bad characters in leadership. Uh, there were a few good ones, but mostly the book of Judges shows us several good examples of bad examples of leadership, yet how God worked things out anyway. And it was a chaotic area, which is described in the very last verse of the book of Judges this way. So here's how the book of Judges ends. In those days, there was no king in Israel. And all the people did what was right in their own eyes. Sounds like a great time, huh? <laughs> now, given that context, the story of Ruth, which then comes next, provides a quiet, out-of-the-way contrast to the chaos of those decades. It's a story of faithfulness, both God's faithfulness and human faithfulness, a story of deep loyalty on the part of Ruth, and it's a story of providence, of God working all things together for good amidst the pains and changes of life. And we'll see that it has a surprise ending, which highlights the providential nature of the story in an amazing way. So I'll be reading uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 22. I'm not going to read all of those verses, um, and then I'll fill in the rest as we go. So this is Ruth 1, 1 to 22. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. So they were refugees because of famine. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Melon and Chilion, and they were, they were Ephratites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These two, her sons, took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant 
that you might find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Said, My daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So Naomi said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Call me no longer Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. The word Mara in Hebrew means bitter. So she gives herself a nickname, Mara, bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has dealt harshly with me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned together with Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, who came back with her from the country of Moab. They came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, with this as our introduction to Ruth, I'd like to look at the story of Ruth from this perspective. That the life of faith is not a straight line from point A to point B, kind of like Interstate 90 through eastern Washington, Washington to South Dakota, where you just zip straight through it from destination to destination without a hitch. It's more like the drive along the Alcan, the Alaska-Canadian Highway, say from Vancouver, Canada to Fairbanks, Alaska. There are twists and turns, elevation gains and drops, rough roads with frost heaves and potholes, other places where the road is torn up and under construction, and so there are detours through God knows where, with wild animals crossing the road that you look at and say, I've never seen one of those before, (laughs) and of course, spectacular scenery along the way. Uh, It's worth the drive, even if you break an axle. It happens. (laughs) The story of Ruth is a good example of that. It isn't a straight line story from point A to point B, but it contains a series of setbacks and losses. Let's look at it first from that perspective. But before we do that, let's take a moment and think about your life right now, where you are today and how you got here. Was it a straight line where you went effortlessly from one rousing success to another on cruise control? Or were there events, either early on or later in life, or both, that sent you or nudged you in an unexpected direction, or caused some change that put you in a new place or into unfamiliar territory? Think about that as we go along so we can find ourselves in the story and find God in our story. Well, in one sense, the story of Ruth is a story of a series of setbacks. In chapter 1, as we heard, Naomi and her husband and their two sons were forced to leave their homeland in Judah uh, on account of a bad famine, and they head to Moab, which was unknown territory. Then Naomi's husband dies. Her sons marry foreign women from Moab, and for 10 years, the women and their husbands are childless for whatever reason. And then Naomi's sons die, leaving three widows in the household. Even though Ruth clings to Naomi, which is her first act of deep loyalty, chapter 1 ends with Naomi's bitter complaint. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. The Lord has dealt harshly with me. And she gives herself this nickname, Mara, which means bitter. Um, Giving yourself an unhelpful nickname is never a good idea. I don't know if you do that. Um, We need to call ourselves by better names. Well, in chapter 2, Naomi is filled with new hope because this man named Boaz appears on the scene as a possible husband for Ruth. Ruth decides to go gleaning in the fields during harvest time, and she accidentally meets Boaz. You have to read how that happens. 
Now, they didn't know it at first, but Boaz turns out to be a next of kin or a near relative to Naomi's deceased husband. And therefore, Boaz has the right and even the responsibility of redemption, where Boaz could not only marry Ruth and hopefully provide children for her, but also reclaim for her the land and possessions of Naomi's husband, because there were no heirs, there were no children uh, to will them to after he had died. So this right of redemption was built into the law of the Old Testament so that widows would be protected and provided for and not left destitute. It was a humane part of their law. Well, it turns out that Boaz is a good man and is kind to Ruth and protective of her and allows her to glean from the fields more than her fair share of what was left for gleaning. This practice of gleaning was another wonderful provision in the law, which you just heard from Deuteronomy. God required his people to be generous to and caring of foreigners and widows. No one was to be left destitute. So, Boaz is a good man. However, he doesn't propose to Ruth. In fact, he doesn't make any moves toward her except in kindness toward her because he respects her. So the chapter closes brimming with hope, but also with great suspense and uncertainty about how this all might work out. In chapter 3, Naomi encourages Ruth to make a risky move in the middle of the night. While the men are all asleep on the threshing floor, which was a normal thing to do during the harvest, workers camped out with the grain on the threshing floor to protect it from animals and thieves, Naomi tells Ruth to go in the middle of the night and lie down at Boaz's feet in the middle of the night. Now, this is not an act of seduction, as one might assume. If it was an act of seduction, she would have laid down next to him. At his side, right? Not at his feet. Laying down at someone's feet was actually an act of humility, and it took the posture of a servant. So she goes, and she lays there. And although Naomi told her to wait until Boaz said something, Ruth takes the initiative. And when Boaz Boaz awakens in the middle of the night, somewhat startled that there's this person lying at his feet, she says to him, spread your cloak over me which is to say, in effect, I want you to spread your wing over me as my husband. Or, to put it bluntly, I want you to ask me to marry you. (laughs) A somewhat bold and risky move on Ruth's part. But right when the tragedy of Ruth's widowhood seems to be resolved into a beautiful love story, a huge detour sign has appeared in the road in Ruth's life, and it looks like she isn't going to get through it or around it. Because, as it turns out, There is another man who, according to Hebrew custom, has prior claim to marry Ruth because he is a closer relative to Naomi's husband than Boaz is. So the impeccably honest Boaz will not proceed without giving this other man his lawful opportunity. And chapter 3 ends, again, in the suspense of another setback, or so it seems. After the midnight rendezvous in chapter 3, Boaz goes to the city gate where official business was conducted. The nearer kinsman comes by, and Boaz lays the situation before him. Naomi's giving up what little property she has, and the duty of the nearer kinsman is to buy it so that the inheritance stays in the family, and so that Ruth and Naomi are provided for. And to our dismay, the kinsman says, I will redeem it. Oh no! (laughs) We don't want him to redeem it. We want Boaz to do that. So again, there seems to be a setback. And the irony of this setback is that it is being caused by honesty and goodness. This fellow is only doing his duty. Actually, everyone in the story is acting honorably. Sometimes the Alcan Highway is clogged up, not with boulders or bears or landslides, but with good workers only doing their duty. Our frustrations are not always caused by tragedy or by wrongdoing, but also by, apparently, ill-timed goodness and honesty. So just when we're about to say, oh no, stop the story, don't let this other fellow marry Ruth, Boaz says to this near kinsman, oh, by the way, remember Columbo, the detective Columbo? Just one more thing, right? This is what Boaz does. I was just noticing. Boaz says, you know, don't you, that Naomi has a daughter-in-law. So when you do the part of the kinsman redeemer and claim the family property for her, you must also take Naomi's daughter 
in law as your wife and raise up offspring in the name of her husband who has died. You knew that, right? Uh, no, actually, I didn't know that, he says. Then to our great relief, the kinsman says, I can't do it. He already has a family he is obligated to, and to marry Ruth would cause complications and distress in his family, even though taking a second wife in those days was allowed. So he declines. Again, an honorable move. Now we're cheering in the background as Boaz gets through the bottleneck of road construction and hightails it to the wedding proposal for Ruth. However, there is still a cloud overhead because Ruth is, to use the Old Testament language, barren. Or at least she seems to be. In chapter 1, we're told that she had been married 10 years to Malon and there were no children. So even now, the suspense isn't quite over until we read chapter 4, where the story finally resolves in a wonderful way and Ruth and Boaz become pregnant. And I'll read that portion of the, uh, the part of the story in a moment. Again, one of the lessons of the book of Ruth is that the life of faith is not a straight line from point A to point B. Life is filled with twists and turns, setbacks and advances, and we often don't know what's coming. But the point of the story is that God indeed works all things together for good. No matter where you are or what is happening, even if, if it seems difficult in the present time, God is working his purposes out. Ruth was written to help us trust God's grace, even when the clouds are sometimes so thick that we can't see the road ahead, let alone the signs along the way that say, go this way or go that way. This is the other great lesson of Ruth, to show us that it was God who acted to turn each setback into a stepping stone to joy, and that it is God in all of our painful experiences who is working everything out for good in the bigger picture of things in the long run. When Naomi's whole life seemed to cave in while in Moab, it was God who gave Ruth to Naomi. We know this because at the core of Ruth's commitment to, to Naomi is her commitment to Naomi's God. She says, your God shall be my God. God had won Ruth's allegiance in Moab, and so it was to God that Naomi owed the amazing love and loyalty of her daughter-in-law. Also in chapter 2, it says that when Ruth went to Judah with Naomi, she was coming to take refuge under the wings of God. Therefore, it's owing to God that Ruth left her home and family to follow and serve Naomi. All along, it was God turning Naomi's setbacks into joys, even when she was oblivious to this at that moment. And although Naomi gives the impression that there's no hope that Ruth could marry and raise up children to continue the family line, all the while, God is preparing a good man named Boaz to do just that. We know that this was God's doing because Naomi herself admits it. She recognizes that the accidental meeting of Ruth and Boaz in the field was, as she puts it, the kindness of God who has not forsaken the living or the dead. In every loss that God's people endure, God is already at work behind the scenes for their gain. And then in the end, God gives Ruth a child. In chapter 4, we read that the townspeople pray for and pronounce a blessing over Ruth and Boaz that they may conceive. And by the way, this wasn't because babies are so cute and they wanted them to experience the cuteness, you know, kind of like having puppies. It's because infertility meant the potential extinction of their culture. I remember when we lived in Alaska and occasionally would come across Native folks who were experiencing infertility in their family or in their village, in their community. The elders grieved this because they knew it could mean the extinction of their culture. It was also important to have children in order to continue the family line and identity and because farming families needed people to work on the farm. Anyway, they know that Ruth was married for 10 years without a child, so they remember Rachel and her story. And they would pray that God would make Ruth like Rachel and Leah, who for a long time were able not to have children. And then, um, again, to use the biblical language, God opened their womb and they provided children. And the author makes it clear that God is the one who caused a child to be conceived in Ruth's story. Again, the life of faith is not a straight line to glory. However, God sees to it that his people get there. And sometimes along the way, there are surprises and surprising outcomes. 
So let me read the last four verses of the book of Ruth to hear the surprise ending. This is Ruth 4, 13 to 17. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David. Wow. This story of famine, of untimely death, of suspense and setback, but also of loyalty and faithfulness results in the birth of Israel's greatest king, David, through whom would come Jesus. As Isaiah foretold it, a shoot shall come up from the stump of Jesse. Although no one knew it at that time, and even for a little while afterward, God was working his purposes out in an extraordinary way. And in gospel writer Matthew's genealogy of Jesus, all of these people are named, including Ruth. Women were not typically mentioned in family genealogies in those days, but in the genealogy of Jesus, it mentions two women. It says, Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab, that's a whole other story, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David, and on it goes to Jesus. In the midst of the chaos and turbulence of the time, we have this simple and touching love story. Out of the way, ordinary in many ways, but it's an ordinary story that becomes extraordinary. However, that's only recognized later on. Ruth, Naomi, Boaz did not see the significance of their role in the moment, at that time. But they stayed faithful to their parts. And this is my final takeaway for us from the story of Ruth. Sometimes we don't know what the end result or outcome of our lives might be. Often it's only seen in hindsight. So this is why faithfulness today is so important in the little things, because God uses all the parts and pieces of the story of our lives to produce good for the future, including our faults and failures, as well as our strengths and successes. God uses all of it to produce good for the future, even if it's a future we won't see in our lifetime. Friends, no story is too small. No life is too insignificant. The little choices that we make, the little faithfulnesses, the courage, the honesty can have a large impact down the road. Well, because of the kind of Christmassy ending of this story, I wanted to sing a carol this morning. So here's a lively and hopeful Advent song titled, Awake, Awake, and Greet the New Morn. We sing it every Christmas season, and I wanted to sing it today, um, and you're going to enjoy it. So let's stand and sing, Awake, Awake, and Greet the New Morn. Hey, Ian. Hang on. We got the wrong song. So look it up in your hymnal. What number is it? Somebody call it out. What is it? 107. So grab a hymnal, turn to number 107. We'll sing it out of the hymnal. And if you don't have a hymnal, get with someone who does. Is everyone there? You're playing the right song. The wrong one's on the screen. And sorry, folks at home, I don't think you're going to have this there, but listen in.
please be seated. Uh, again, let me introduce uh, Joan Penny, um, the Senior Director of Resource Development, Marketing, and Communications at Housing Hope. We love hearing from our mission partners, and so we're glad, so glad, Joan, you could be with us today and look forward to our new partnership with you. Good morning, everybody. Pleasure to be in your company today, and uh, for you online as well. Thank you for having me. And I want to give a shout out to Lynn for uh, being such a fierce leader uh, with her accomplice, Carol, in being our Madrona Highlands ambassadors for our first uh, ambassadors in South Snohomish County. So thank you, Lynn, for making this introduction and, and, and leading me uh, through the way of South County. Um, we uh, have two uh, parts of our agency. The first is Housing Hope, which is the only affordable housing nonprofit developer in Snohomish County. We serve specifically Snohomish County. And we do all affordable housing, multifamily, all across uh, the county. We do small, integrated, settings like Madrona Highlands, which will be 54 units of housing. And the reason we do small and integrated is that we know in social sciences that people do better when they're integrated in a variety of incomes versus isolated into areas of poverty. So that's really an important part of our formula. And we know when we welcome our community members and family members out of homelessness and into housing, it just starts with housing. And so the second part of our organization is about skills and employment. And you'll see Hope Works up there. We create pathways to self-sufficiency um, through social enterprises that provide hope and training. And right now we have four different social enterprises that all of our tenants and actually anybody experiencing homelessness even if they're not in our units uh, or not necessarily even homeless are looking for direction these are free services and the four enterprises we have are groundworks which is our um you see the next slide might have that one there yeah, oh, we'll start with this one. This one's Tomorrow's Hope. Child care. We provide child care services for families with lower incomes. We also train people to become certified in child care. During COVID, Snohomish County lost, lost 1,600 child care spots. So we are in a deficit for child care. And what more important thing than to embrace our young children and help them escape the patterns of poverty that we have in our culture. So this is a really important part of our mission. And um, so that's tomorrow's hope. Um, you can see some data there. This other one is, yep, 86% of our children at Tomorrow's Hope, ages birth to five, have showed developmental improvement, and that's a big deal. They just don't show up and play all day, but we also do a lot of teaching and nourishing and caring for them and their parents. It's very important to help break that cycle. The next um, social enterprise we have is Renew Home and Decor. It's a beautiful store. It's on Broadway in Everett, um, and we teach retail skills. We take slightly used furniture, and the trainees learn how to fix furniture, how to repair it, clean it, how to do the retail side of it, how to have social integration with people when they come in. And by the way, in each of our social enterprises, there's a tw it's a 12-week program. And the first six are about self, self-efficacy, self-esteem, um, financial literacy, how to be a good renter, how to live on a budget, how to find the different resources. And so many of our comments when we do graduation uh, are based on um, that portion, people expressing, and it's a very different, it's a very diverse range of ages, but people expressing 
a sense of worth, self-worth, that they'd never been told before that they had value. They'd never been told before that they had value or purpose. And so those 12 weeks of uh, training in each of our social enterprises are very important. Uh, this is Tina. She's the director of our store. She overcame a long uh, history with heroin addiction and her family as well as her personally. She was able to escape all that is now a director of our store and helps and uh, teaches others that they can find the way as well. She's a, she's a force, let me tell you. She's found her way and her voice and uh, is doing great things for that social enterprise. The next slide, Groundworks, that's our landscaping uh, company. We also have that 12-week course in landscaping, and so they can learn a trade and get back out into the workplace. We'll do the next one. Here's a before and after. We love before and afters. We'll go ahead to the next slide, please. And then Kindred Kitchen. Kindred Kitchen is also located on Broadway. Come for lunch. Come for a coffee in the morning. Um, this is culinary arts, and we teach people how to work in the culinary arts industry. Not only do we run the retail coffee lunch shop, but we do catering as well. And we're trying to grow that program. Uh, it's a uh, really significant uh, program, and, and that one of all of them probably has the most enrollment in it. Go ahead to the next slide. You can see our facility there. It's right across from Compass Health's new, new building that's going up. If you haven't been along Broadway and Everett lately, boy, do we need Compass Health in a new facility. All behavioral health uh, units, and they're a really good common cause partner to the work that we do. Next slide, please. And then this is Madrona Highlands. You, um, it, we will be welcoming people in October, late October of 2024. Um, we are so thankful to the Edmonds Lutheran Church who had a vision and values and the dream of doing affordable housing on their large lot. We were the second partner that they've tried to uh, partner with to do housing. And we're thankful that we have a marriage now, and we're moving forward in the dating process. And um, they couldn't be a better partner. My gosh, it's so joyful to have people want you to come to the neighborhood versus what we normally get, um, which is not in my backyard. And so uh, we really just run to their campus quite often just to get a refill of all that joy when things are tough. And so we are uh, continue to work on Madrona, and um, that's what our Madrona Highland ambassadors are working on, and your goodwill to take us on and be a uh, support to that. So thank you very much. Next slide, please. And I will have you go ahead to the next slide. Uh, I think we have a bigger view, a bigger picture that I put in there. Go ahead and do the next one. There should be an aerial view. There it is. It's a little dark, but that gives you a size of the footprint there. And uh, it was really right size to the neighborhood because there is a lot of multifamily that comes. So one of the things I picked up today in your prayer of confession and reflection that I work on daily in communications and marketing. Help us to relinquish fear and false narratives. There are many false narratives about how people come into homelessness. There can be a lot of judgment, and everybody comes to homelessness in a very different way. It, the stories are so diverse. But the number one issue that our mission leans into is the fact uh, in the Pacific Northwest and actually the whole West Coast, homelessness is higher than the rest of the United States by 12 to 15 percent. And the reason that is, is because of the marketplace. Number one, we have a housing shortage. If you read the book that Greg Colburn, uh, who's a doctorate out of the University of Washington in real estate and studies, wrote, uh, 
It's a very profound read on causation. And specifically, you can take cities like Detroit. Detroit has probably some of the highest poverty in the nation, but they do not have a homelessness problem because they have shelter. Now, it's not always great shelter, but they have housing. It's accessible. It's affordable. We don't have the luxury of a large surplus of housing or a diversity of housing. The single family home by large in all of our municipalities remains the most common by 80% of any type of housing stock. So we advocate not only for smaller in, um, integrated multifamily, but duplexes, fourplexes, townhouses, where people can have a much more realistic um, uh, opportunity to afford to live here. It's very expensive. Um, and so the narratives of people that we see are really mostly people who are priced out of the marketplace. Colburn in his book also looks at addiction and behavioral health and true to his data which is national we only have about 18 to 20 percent of the people we serve are would be considered in that category uh, and they're they're valid powerful stories we often see people in addiction and behavioral health issues on the streets and so people connect that with the majority of people experiencing homelessness and it's actually not the entire narrative. The financial shortfall is the most accurate narrative for where we live. Um, the fastest growing, fastest growing population of people experiencing homelessness are unaccompanied women 65 years and older. Unaccompanied women 65 years and older. Their social security, I know, it's your sister sitting right next to you. Um, it's me, it's, it's anybody in that, in that age category. Social Security cannot compete with this inflated marketplace. And you, can't, you just can't make your budget come full circle when rents are actually higher than most mortgages. That is detrimental. Um, so the project that we have here, while it's a family project, and then we will have the scriber um, project, which will be the first project built on school district property. Edmond School District has 740 homeless children. McKinney Vento, McKinney Vento, that was an unfunded mandate created during the Reagan era that told school districts that no matter what happens with this kid, we want you to bus them from wherever they find affordable shelter to your school so that school is not interrupted. So even if they might be living in North Everett, if they've been going to school in Edmonds, the McKinney-Vento federal law requires districts to bus children to where they've been going to school. That's expensive. And every district is facing that. Every district in Snohomish County right now is, is running about 10 to 12 percent higher than last year of homeless children. Homeless children are people who couch surf. Um, they live in their cars. Um, they don't have a stable place. They're living in dwellings that are meant for one family. Sometimes two or three are living there. It's a much broader definition of homelessness than the HUD definition. If you're couch surfing, HUD does not consider you homeless. And so it's, it's uh, the, when you look at those point in time counts under the HUD rules, the McKinney-Vento counts are far more accurate of the size of the issue. So we're going to be doing that at Scriber. And they will always own the property, but we will um, take the bill from um, building it and operating it and we will serve the homeless students in that district. Again, it's only 52 units out of 740 kids who need it, but um, it's a solution. We see this kind of housing in other districts across the United States where the legislatures have a, a, uh, allowed districts to take what we knew as surplus property. It's odd to think of that now when we're closing so many schools because of budget and dropping enrollments. But the housing shortage is part of the school district's issue 
for poor enrollment. If you don't have affordable places for families to live, they can't go to school there. So this is part of a solution. But in Northern California, just outside of San Francisco, they use this kind of legislation not for the kids, but to house the faculty who couldn't afford to live there. And that's called the Shirley Chisholm Learning Community. You remember um, Shirley Chisholm and her great work in um, uh, our federal uh, organizations. But so we're, we try and stay nimble in this work because solutions come in different ways. If there were only one way to get through this, we'd be all over it. But there's, people come to homelessness in different ways. And so our solutions must stay nimble and flexible and be open to what, is, what people are experiencing. And that's how we work. It's not a straight line, as you were talking earlier. It's a zig and a zag of uh, how to get people out on their own and on their feet. And it's, it's not easy work, but it's the most important work of our time right now as homelessness grows, not only across the United States, but worldwide. People are experiencing this worldwide. I, I read all kinds of things every day in the media, and it's very interesting how different countries approach it. But you, you are all part of the solution. You're leaning in. And that's how we get better. That's how we make democracy whole for everybody to have a place at the table. And I thank you for that. That's not easy to do. And we're very, very thankful to be in your company. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Joan. We're learning so much, and we look forward to continuing to learn and to um, partner and be helpful in whatever ways we can. Please join me um, in prayer and those who would like to join in the Lord's Prayer together. Loving God, as we see the need and the pain of our world, we pray for healing. Healing in our country, healing among the nations. We pray for a provision of food where there is hunger, for freedom where there is oppression, for joy where there is pain, that your may, love may bring, bring peace to all. And we pray that the leaders of all nations will work together to meet the challenges facing our world. Loving God, we thank you for the joy of human love in the bonds of family and friendship. And on this Father's Day, we thank you for fathers and all of those involved in our upbringing men who nurtured and provided for us. Continue to strengthen and, where needed, heal human bonds of love in families and friendships across the generations. Comforting God, we pray for those saddened by the death of someone close and dear to them, either recently or at this time of year. Help us to experience the comfort of your spirit within us and the support of the church family around us until we are reunited once more in your heavenly kingdom. Merciful God, when our lives feel out of sorts because of illness or other problems, help us to experience your presence, which is peace. In this time of prayer now, we lift to your light and presence those who need our prayers today. So hear us as we lift up people, whether in the silence of our hearts or out loud, in need of your grace. Thank you, loving God, that you hear our prayers. And now, gracious God, help us to be more aware of your presence 
and help us to trust in you more in all that we do in the week ahead. We pray with thanksgiving in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Now sing a beloved song of faithfulness, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Now go in peace, and as you go, may the grace of Christ attend you, the love of God surround you, and the Holy Spirit keep you, that you might live in faith, abound in hope, and grow in love now and forevermore. And all of God's beloved said, Amen. Amen.